California True Crime is a podcast that sometimes deals with heinous acts of violence towards other individuals. This podcast may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to California True Crime. I'm Jessica, and with me are Sean and Charles. Sean, how are you doing this episode? I'm doing good. A little tired. It's a was a long day, but excited to be here with you guys. And Charles, how about you? I'm excellent. I'm excited to uh, be recording with you guys after a little uh, little break. We took a, a couple of weeks off for the holiday season. So this episode, we're just kind of doing a fun thing, just to ring in 2021. To give our listeners an idea of things that are upcoming, things we've been researching, some insight into our past episodes of the season, uh, some true crime things that are happening around California. We'll share, I think, a couple of reviews, um, answer some questions from listeners, and at the very end, answer some questions that will hopefully give you some insight into who we are. Before we get into the episode, we want to thank all of our listeners and followers who've supported us just throughout this entire podcast, but especially last year. You guys are all amazing, and we are able to keep going because of you. It was kind of a hard year for us. Yeah, with the lockdown and going from seeing you, Sean, in person every week and recording and getting to, well, live life like normal people to what the three of us, but also all of you are having to deal with and lockdown and the quarantine. And it's it's been a hard year, I think, for everyone. Right. That's an understatement. And it kind of challenged us because we had sort of a plan going into this new season. Yeah. And it got a little bit blown up because of everything that happened. I think for what we've put out so far, we're we're doing okay. (laughs) We can. Oh yeah. I mean, I I know it's not like what we wanted, but it. I don't think 2020 was what we wanted. But looking forward to the future. Really optimistic in life. Yeah, I think I, I I'm on a positive note to not make it so maudlin. Like Jess said, we kind of had a plan. We we used to record. If you're if you're listening to our show from the first season on, you know that we were, originally we recorded at Chateau Walnut, which was uh, Sean's studio. And this year, we actually uh, were able to set up a small. We're we're starting to set up our own small recording space in our own house called uh, Snail Ranch Studio. So it was fun to try to like figure out that which which has been. It's been a learning curve, but it's been really fun. And Sean, you're recording in a new space as well, right? Right. I moved away, and I am now in the hangar, which it might the name still might change, but for right now, I'm in the hangar, and um, it, it's getting there, lear- learning the quirks about it. But just like this, doing this over the computer constantly, be just staring at you guys on a screen while we do this, it's it's a little different, and it'll be good to be able to yell at each other in person again right right luckily we were i think able to really figure it out although i think we're still kind of working on it charles on our studio end (laughs) so why you might have heard me yell at you a little bit in our thanksgiving episode but we're still fixing that and we've been lucky i think because that's kind of been our biggest obstacle i think during all this is trying to figure out how to keep it going and i know a lot of people out there have had far more difficulties So we really appreciate everybody listening, kind of sticking out with us, and we hope to bring you a lot of good new episodes on kind of a variety of topics. So I'm excited. The the episodes coming up, I'm really excited for. I I know I have I have a series coming up that I've been working on for the past, I won't say quite a year, but did a lot of research on it. I'm really excited to get that out to so you can listen to them. I know you have another few episode series that's coming out that you've been working on for I think going on two years now so yeah. I'm very excited you've been kind of cagey about it I actually haven't in the last two years I really haven't seen a lot of it I've seen piles of your research laying around the house but I actually don't I I, I know the topic but I don't know the particular so I'm very excited to hear that 
Yeah, we had to clean for Christmas because we, our little bubble includes our immediate family. And I have a lot of piles of research everywhere. So <laughs> I to pick that up for the first time in uh, several, several months. But I'm also excited for your, it'll be five episodes, right? Yeah, my episode, it, there'll be five episodes. They'll actually be covering um, uh, the murder of uh, Gwen Arejo in the Bay Area in 2000, in the early 2000s, and dealing with not only her life, but some of the changes that happened to state law because of her murder and some difficult topics that deal with uh, why she was murdered and the fallout from that. So, I, like I said, it's, it, it was a really hard case to research for me i went into it thinking i knew something about it and then kind of walked away um realizing that i i didn't and learned a lot so i'm very very excited i'm very proud of it so i'm happy sean what do you have coming up for people i don't know that's the problem but that's like how i like if you've listened recently the the case of carlo mercado that one was kind of, I have ideas in my head and I feel like I have a plan and then something hits me and that one I, I researched and got it done. So I have ideas, but I don't know because I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to say this and then everyone's like, where is it? Because I might never get to it. So, but I do have some ideas and hopefully they'll, one of them might be a three-parter that I'm working on, but we'll see. We also have in the work uh, works a few um, cases that have been suggested to us by um, you guys that listen, and we really appreciate that because we're always looking to try to connect to more stories in California. And again, we're always taking uh, suggestions and information. We've gotten um, actually lately we've gotten a lot of um, activity in our Facebook group. You are always welcome to join our Facebook group. Uh, send us a message. At, it's at California True Crime on Facebook. Um, we also have gotten uh, a lot of outreach on our Twitter page at Cali true crime, as well as our Instagram. So if you're a social media person, uh, stop by, drop us a line. Uh, if you have an interesting story or questions about either a case we've already done, or you'd like us to see maybe checking into covering another case, you can always drop us a line on, on one of our social medias or email us directly at, uh, at Cali True Crime at gmail.com. And I think we can tell people the one we chose because we took some suggestions during mm -hmm. a period of time last year. The one we chose to do is the Chowchilla bus kidnapping. So that is something that will be coming up. Probably not too soon, but it will come up. Right. And hopefully we can do some pretty in depth stuff with that, with that story. And that was, that was, there was a lot of great suggestions and, uh, and and from multiple people, actually, Chachilla was one of the ones that was suggested to us uh, in our discussion group um, from a couple of people. So we thank you for that. If if you had a suggestion for us, understand that it's on our list. We we took all our suggestions and put them on a list, and this is the one that was kind of at the top because of of how many people requested of it. If you requested one that didn't necessarily get picked, we're we're still it's not out of the running yet. For me, also Chachilla that. That was one that really, really interests me from way back in the day and all the old scary um, news reels in the 70s that you can find on like YouTube. It's just the feel of it. It's just such a crazy story. So, And also being from having, and I think we all have had that opportunity, the, the three of us and maybe some of, of you the listening that are familiar with the Central Valley is driving by where the bus was buried. You know, as a as a little kid and having somebody point it out like, well, that was where the bus was buried when the kids were kidnapped on a school bus. And that sufficiently, I think, stuck with me. When we were little, my great grandmother lived in Livermore and it's where um, my grandmother also grew up. And I remember when we were little, maybe this is why I became interested in true crime. Uh, they would take us on. We'd go visit and they would take us on the trip to go see where the bus was. Mm -hmm. And so I just, it's a really vivid thing from when I was actually pretty little. And they lived not too far from where it happened. So it was obviously something that was on that day they were in town and just a huge memory for them. Also, if anyone is from Livermore, does anyone call right when you're going up or down the Altamont Butt Mountain? Because my friend who's from Livermore always said, hey, there's Butt Mountain. Just wanted to bring that up because it looks like a butt. but. It has grass. The where it says Jesus saves. Yeah. 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 
Is that is that considered Butt Mountain? We actually lived in Livermore, Charles and I. Yeah, I never I never <laughs> called it that. <laughs> but now that's all I'm going to see. Yeah, okay, no, yeah. I, I thank thank you for that, Sean. Hey, no, I California history right there. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a loose a loose definition of California history. <laughs> So we're just going to kind of talk a little bit about episodes we've already had this season. We've covered a lot of different uh, different kinds of episodes this season. We've covered, I think, two unsolved cases. Are, is there an episode that stuck with you, Charles? Yeah, for me, I think w- I think the first case that really stuck with me was Evelyn Hernandez, and I think because it was happening at a time when where you have like the Lacey Peterson case and everybody saw that. And until you brought that case up, I'd never even, never even thought of that. Never heard of it. And then going through that, every case we do, unfortunately is a heartbreaking case, but this, this young woman with a child who was trying to do her absolute best to take care of her son, having then fallen off the face of the planet to be found in such a state later was was really it really has stuck with me just that idea of at any moment your life can be snatched away from you and and in s- such a way that nobody knows why or how or who did it and yeah it's a case that stuck with me as well i think especially because there's been so much stuff in the news about scott peterson so it's always something i think about when i see that um it is an ongoing case it's still an open case so there's not much more information from the police i actually made a phone call to see if there was anything um, more that we could tell people. We will put some more uh, links out with the information for the police. If you have anything you want to, you know, call and let them know if you know anything about that case. But it is a really terrible, terrible case. And you can find, like, with all of our cold cases, if you go to CaliforniaTrueCrime.com, uh, we do have the cold cases, um, the information that we have, as well as numbers to police officers, tip lines. Uh, you can find those under our cold case section of our website or, again, CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. What about you, Jessica? Uh, what's a, what's a, an episode that really stuck out to you? I think one of the episodes that really stuck out to me is one that Sean did. It was the one we did on Care and Not. Mm-hmm. Um, because you hear about these cases, and then when you research them and really learn so much about the individual people, as much as we care about them the first time, it just it just... There's like a shift in your mind. It's it's different. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a case that really stuck with me, not just because of her, but because of everything her family went through um, and just all of the details surrounding it. And also because it brought up for me when you and I, Charles, we were talking about some of the evidence in that case and mm-hmm. how it was presented and who was presented by. And we, we came to find out actually that it was someone who wasn't really um, now is considered not trustworthy mm-hmm. person and that led us to look into other cases where people have that man um or the gentleman actually testified and then now people have been found innocent so that stuck with us because now we're actually researching a case where that where that happened and i think that's really important for us to cover as well so some that's something i've been thinking a lot about now that case we'll probably report on close i mean we're we're recording this in january so we're probably hopefully you'll be listening to this later towards you know summertime but I think that that too, and we we always talk about sometimes our misconceptions or or that bias that we bring to the table when we're we're researching or we're looking at some of these stories, and and that one really I, I'm thinking back to like the fiber evidence, mm-hmm. you know specifically, and yeah. and how so many movies that I've watched and so many times that I've read that, and you know it, this particular fiber evidence used being used in a court to to, to as a not a maybe linchpin piece of evidence, but a, a brick in the wall uh, of going to convict somebody, and then to realize that you know science says it's not necessarily exactly what we think in our. It's like it's like what we've talked about before with DNA evidence too, n- not always necessarily being what we think it is because of the media. And I, I do think that one stuck. I also go back to the Karenot case because of her father. I I think what her father accomplished. And what he went through was amazing. It really was, Shauna. Every, everything that he did for everyone. And such a, it, it's nothing can ever, I can't imagine anything ever being able to help that hurt. But the fact that he tried to accomplish so much good in the time that he had left to make sure that something like that didn't happen to somebody else, I think is is astounding. 
And going back to your fiber evidence, it's still hard for how long we've read cases about that. We And Jessica, you brought it up and we talked about it and everything. And then if I see a new case that might have fiber evidence, I'm still like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a sure thing right there. And I'm like, just because we've known it for so long, it's hard to it's hard to change and, until you learn. But it, it was, yeah, the fiber evidence thing. And I go even back to, to another case that you did, Sean, was the Pinion Pines case when we did a bunch of research on cell phone evidence. And listening to other podcasts and reading other stories of true crime using cell phone evidence to put a person in a particular place and then to find out well it's not necessarily right always accurate and I, and again I'm with you I read a story the other day out of a, a news periodical dealing with a court case that had to do with cell phone evidence and my immediate reaction was just what you said oh Cell phone puts them in the place. They must be guilty. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that, yeah. That's like the Carlo Mercado case too. How we talked about it was a whole year that they tried to put them together and they didn't find them together by pinging cell phones. It wasn't evidence to put anyone in jail, but they were just trying to figure things out. But I still was like, whoa, they were never around each other. Like, I still think the science is so great, and I don't even understand it. So. Well, and I think that's the always the interesting thing, and I think that's why I really have enjoyed going over. And this is this is a shameless plug, so we're hoping you're you're continuing. You like our podcast and continue to listen to it. But I spent a lot of time researching the court case for for my upcoming series and the intricacies of the court, and it it really hinging on people's perceptions of what is true and their feelings. And uh, and realizing that we're all susceptible to that, mm -hmm. you know, is that we 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 do bring in our own biases, we do bring in our own feelings into a court case, and 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 something as simple as I watched CSI last night, so I totally understand DNA evidence, and I'm expecting right. to see DNA evidence, or or David Crusoe comes in and takes his sunglasses off and tells you one liners <laughs> to make sure that you know what's going on, right? Exactly, or I'm I'm expecting a huge. Uh, who done it? You know, from from years of watching Matt Locke and Perry Mason, right? With my with my episode, I think I'm gonna have to go with um, Marina Ruggiero, just because that case. I I think it was that case we were still able to meet while we were going over that case, and then I wanted to solve it after we were at the house. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna solve this thing, and for me. All the hotel key stuff, learning about hotel keys was really interesting to me. I don't know why, but I thought that was very interesting. Just yeah. thinking about that knife they found years later, the thinking about could it have been a master key, someone who worked there? Because it, it's just so many what ifs on that episode. And it bothered me just knowing that it's unsolved and horrible. And that one just stuck in my mind really the whole time. And Hotel keys, though, that fascin that fascinated me. And actually, I think you're right. I actually that was the last case that we actually discussed in person together because I do remember sitting around our dining room table right. for a good many hours researching that exact hotel and finding layouts of the rooms, and then having a huge discussion around maps about how far and distances, and who could have you know like trying to f figure out how many people were in the hotel and what you know what would the average occupancy of a you know hotel that size at that time of year, and having this n need i'm with you Sean I think that any of our any of our unsolved ones are always hard because of that f that feeling like it's it should be solved right and that that young girl being murdered. And again, not that any murder is ever justified or, or warranted, but in such a in such a senseless way, in w with a lack of any, w at least to our understanding of of how we researched it, uh, any real evidence. Right. You know, I, and I I don't mean to jump over you, but that that when you mentioned the hotel locks, I will say that after we did that research and we talked about it. I am sufficiently freaked out by hotels now <laughs> because I, I really did. I thought, oh, man, my hotel room is so, you know, like these key cards. And I knew, you know, I know that they're throwaways and they're rekeyed. Re -keyed, and, well, then that's going to make them safer. I am. I, I do not look at hotel rooms the same way anymore. 
I, one of the things I really like about our episodes is that we each find something, I think, as you guys are talking about the keys, that is interesting to us uh-huh. in sort of maybe a different way, whether it's a legal issue or a historical issue. Are there any other... I know when I look at my episodes, I've become really interested in cases where people have been found innocent. I think covering Candy Bullock, where the police blamed someone for decades, who uh-huh. it turned out had not committed that crime. So I'm looking for that in, in new cases that I'm looking to pick. Uh, Shauna, do you have anything like that where you're looking forward for things you might want to cover, either like a historical event or? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it matters on the area, knowing California, knowing the time and the area. I, I know that I, for some reason, have focused a lot on Southern California. I I go there to visit friends and stuff and have some history there. So I'm wondering if that's like why I it it has to intrigue me, but then at the same time, I've never been up north and like hung out where like Kenny was. But that case was so I was obsessed with it for when I was researching it. So I think it just matters on what catches my eye and how much I'm getting dedicated to it at that time. How about you, Charles? Is there anything you're looking to maybe find in a case to research? No, I kind of I'll echo what Sean said. I think it. For me, I the the I, I think if you listen to this podcast for long enough, you you have started to figure out kind of our own bents. There's a, I think there's a little taste of what what we're really interested. For me, I gravitate towards the history of an, an area and the the background on the people and the culture and the and the I really like that. So anytime I get to learn a little bit something new about the history of my state i am i i love so there's that i i am with sean as far as it's it's sometimes the weirdest thing i mean like hotel key i did not expect to be researching hotel keys you know when we started Mm -hmm. this and and then to get on that and then spend a good chunk of time looking up manufacturers and you know patents and things like that i i was fascinated i also uh you know i think the the law started out to be something that i was not i was it was not one of my areas i wasn't the legal aspect was always seemed like a gordian knot to me until we really started getting into it and i think having those discussions with you and sean and really piecing out what happens at a trial and understanding the legal or i won't say understanding but trying to look at the legal complexities in a different way that's really been that started to kind of fire me up a little bit more too so i'm always kind of interested uh, about that as well how about you jessica is what's what's if you had to uh, pick something that really like that that gem in the rough when you're looking at a case what would it be i i really have become interested i think in just unsolved cases in general but also ones where people have been proven innocent because so often the the stuff that we talk about all of the time where it seems really clear this person did it is the same in those cases and then a piece of evidence will they'll, somebody will find it or dna often and it just turns out they weren't. It just challenges your preconceptions, like you were mm-hmm. saying, about how you look at things. I think that to me, too, when we when we talk about these things, and, and I know, again, if you've listened to this, if you listen to our last year's kind of end year, where we talked about our process, just to re- reiterate, originally, we would, each of us would pick a case that would interest us, we'd do our research, and we'd bring it to the table, and the three of us would go back over it and discuss it and kind of pull it apart. And that's continued with with the pandemic and the shutdown is we still do that. We just do it remotely, but we do our research and we bring it. And I think that to me has been the, 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 the most, one of the mo- the best parts of doing this endeavor with you guys is the fact that I think through our research and through our discussions that we're constantly challenging each other's preconceived notions and our biases. And it's been a fun, I get, I get, I will, you know, I'll use fun as a term, uh, although our subject matter isn't sometimes not necessarily always the happiest subject matter, but it is interesting to challenge our precon. You know, myself, my biases walking into things like, you, you know, looking back to the history of the sex registry when we did Stephen Stainer, and really seeing what the history of that was and how that started, and and how the law looks at different people and and of different races and different genders. That's that's been a an eye opening uh, experience. It definitely has. Starting this, I thought. When we started, let's do Zodiac. And then that was taken. And so then we started doing this. And it wasn't the the 
first template wasn't what we are now. And I learned so much because of mm-hmm. that, because we decided to focus on things that we didn't know to do the research. I mean, and we're all learning. Yeah. Uh, the elephant in the room, which we've talked about and someone else did, uh, we don't have police and enfor- law enforcement backgrounds <laughs> and we aren't lawyer backgrounds. It was a bad review one time. Who wants to listen to people who don't have law enforcement backgrounds talk about law enforcement? And we try to do as much research as we can because we want to give the best episodes that we can. So I like learning. And this Mm -hmm. has been an extreme learning experience for like the laws in California and just weird things. And I remember doing Puente Hills and I was researching the layout of the the room i i was spending three hours trying to figure out the layout of a room and just thought it was weird research but at the same time it was a lot of fun trying to figure it out yeah any opportunity we have a chance to to learn something i think we all kind of jump at which led us down the, and i and it is i love how you said that sean is where we are now is not where we necessarily started i don't think any of the three of us really knew when we started what it would become, but I'm very happy with what what we're doing. I think also there are so many great podcasts out that do a great job of covering crime and I, you know, and true crime and victims' rights and things like that. And I think, you know, we're trying in our own small way to find a small niche um, that I think we do really well. I always go back to the idea that despite not being a lawyer or in law enforcement here in California, you're going to be asked to vote on those issues. Right. Which is something we've seen over and over through all the decades um, when it comes to laws passed either because of the case we're covering or those laws affecting the case that we're covering. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we have to figure it out and figure and challenge ourselves on how we think about it. And, and we're asked to sit on juries. I yeah. mean, I'm not a lawyer. None of us are. We're not police officers. But we're going to be asked at some point to stand up as our, I really like jury duty. I get excited when they get called down to to sit in the in the jury box and be interviewed. I feel you know it's kind of corny, but it is not only it's my civic duty, but I'm I'm happy to do it. I I like the process. I'm fascinated by the process. But but m- the majority of the people in that room are not have an intimate understanding of the law. But we're like the exact same as you said with voting. We're at we're asked to to make judgment on others based on on a law that we may not necessarily understand. Yeah, and hopefully we do a pretty good job of covering the other aspects, the moral aspects or social aspects, the historical aspects, whatever it is that we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. So 2020 was also a really big year for news, true crime news here in California. We're just going to talk a little bit about a couple of things that happened here in 2020. The first, I think, probably one of the biggest things was the news about Scott Peterson having his death penalty decision overturned. And now a judge is looking at his case to decide whether or not there was enough jury issues to overturn his entire sentence. What do you guys think about that? I know this isn't a case we've covered. It's a case we're used to because we live very near where this happened. I think, I don't know if he should get another trial, but I mean, that jury wasn't, it wasn't the best jury. But at the same time, I'm not going to judge because I wasn't there. Right. I didn't sit on it. But the actions after the trial is what I saw, and that's what I'm going off of. But mm-hmm. I don't really know, and I'm, I'm, the judge can make that decision because I really don't want to. So, Yeah. I saw an article today about how difficult it's been for the family, for Lacey Peterson's family, um, to just kind of wait to see what happens. Right. Uh, they have said that they will reti- retry the penalty phase, but it will depend also on whether or not uh, what the judge decides for whether or not the whole thing gets thrown out. I, I don't know. I, I feel like, like you said, for the three of us, and I, it's not just the three of us. I think any, if you were alive and watching the news at this time, there was so much of this case, and there's, and it was sometimes portrayed almost as a circus. So I, I, I am, I'm still. I think before we started doing these kind of researches, before I was a little bit maybe more hard, harder edge and said, no, I don't think he deserves a, a second trial. But I think taking a step back and saying, you know, were things done the correct way according to the law 
was he given every opportunity and not necessarily because I believe he's guilty or innocent, but because I, I believe the rules are important. So if those rules are in violate, you know, if the, the rules were violated in some way, then I do believe that maybe it, it's proper to give that second chance. Again, I'm not here to say he's guilty or innocent. He was found guilty by a court of law. And, and I, like Sean said, I wasn't there. I didn't sit on the jury. I didn't see the evidence. I know what the news reported and I know what gossip amongst the Central Valley was. But that's not that's not what this is about. This is about where the rules followed according to the law. Yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens. We'll keep you guys updated when we find out any information. It's a little bit surreal to see people talking about this again. Mm -hmm. And I don't living out here, I think it might be a little bit different than not living out here. You're kind of subjected more to like you're saying gossip and people talking. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's a general belief among people that he did not commit this crime. I think most people accept yes he did but with well i agree with you sean i think you even mentioned it in one of our episodes i don't remember which one it was it was one with the we talked about the jury and uh the judge kind of talk with them about behavior after the trial i think that was Karen not wasn't it i think so and we were you you said something about how that didn't seem like it happened here because that mm -hmm. was a big issue it really did seem like there were a couple of jury members who and i don't know if that's something they're taking into consideration but who really were talking about kind of wanting to find him guilty. So it brought up questions. So we'll see what happens. I know it can have other issues because if they do have to retry this case, it will be expensive. And there's already been a very expensive case in this county, in Modesto. Um, though a lot of people who have loved ones whose cases have not been solved have been very upset that the amount of money has been sent, has been spent in those cases. And it doesn't appear that that same amount has been spent in theirs. We've talked a lot about, about how things can look versus how things really are. But, mm -hmm. you know, there are limited funds. I'm doing a bonus episode coming up where that becomes an issue in solving a case. And I think it's something to worry about. I think that's another, another aspect that we really, we, we try to cover when it comes up, has been a part of a lot of our discussions off air or in, I guess you'd call it bonus material, is the economics of that. You know, it's I think most people understand, like, you know, the price of a good defense can mean the difference sometimes between you being found guilty or you being found innocent. Famous case in California. Some people would argue was that, you know, like O.J. Simpson trial, the amount of money that he spent on his defense attorneys. However, I think what's not talked about a lot is the economics of the courts themselves, you know, moving a, moving a case to a different county and the original county being on the hook and how many millions and millions of dollars are spent and on ancillary things for these cases is astronomical. And that being a factor in what gets prosecuted and what doesn't and how it gets prosecuted sometimes is, is an unfortunate occurrence that needs, maybe needs to be looked at. So the other huge thing that happened here last year in California is the sentencing of Joseph D'Angelo, um, often known as the Golden State Killer, the East Area Rapist, the original Night Stalker, or the Visalia Ransacker. And we actually watched, or I did, I guess, watched the victim's um, impact statements mm -hmm. over a couple of days. Did either of you guys check any of that out? Yeah, I was able to tune in actually at work during uh, some break times and then had a little bit of going in a, in a headphone while I was supposed to be you can cut to be that working. out yeah it was an amazing thing to watch um i i didn't watch it but i think what i kept watching which i think was interesting to me with this whole case they have those pictures of him young but they always showed the pictures where he's frail and i just think it's weird i think we've talked about this many a times of the perceptions of how they, mm -hmm. you know, but I just thought it was weird. They just used his arrest picture or showing him in court instead of showing the pictures of what he looked like when it was happening. Mm -hmm. Does that anything to you? I'm sorry I brought this up just now, but I just. It, no, it, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, oft, you, you don't often see a whole lot of photos of him in his prime, like in his, you know, 30s or 40s. Yeah. There's that one picture where he's like in his police uniform with his mustache, which right. could have easily been used. But you just see this frail thing, and they just use that, and I don't know why. Yeah, and I know that it bothered a lot of victims as well. Okay. Because he, you know, he's manipulative, obviously, mm -hmm. and 
portraying himself as someone who's sick or older or trying to gain sympathy, I believe is what the kind of general idea of what he was trying to do. So I don't know why the news, is that what you're talking about, the news? Yeah, I mean, you, you see him. I mean, do you, when you think of him now, I mean, unless yeah. you're like extremely into the case, you probably think of his old picture. You probably don't think of the sketch with the ski, cat, ski mask on or the cop picture with the mustache. You think of him in the orange jumpsuit with his mouth open, either with a COVID guard or not, because that's what they kept. It's not just like, from the beginning, then they started showing him where he has that COVID shield. So it's like they kept keeping with this man who is in the wheelchair all the time or anything. I don't, I don't know. I didn't. I yeah. I thought it was interesting how they portrayed him. Oh. Yeah, and then they did finally release after it was all over video of him inside of his cell. Uh, you know, kind of working out, walking around, oh. looking far more healthy than he portrayed himself mm-hmm. in the videos that you're talking about in front of the court, that kind of thing. But I absolutely understand what you're saying. I know that's something you guys talked about. Oh, no, you guys didn't. We we didn't talk about it, but it was something like on the Carlo Mercado. We had talked about it off where they kept showing a picture. If you guys have listened to the Carlo Mercado case yet, the news kept showing a picture of him younger, like in a... It was a prom. It was like a prom it was like a, picture almost. It was like a prom, yeah. prom photo. He's got the flower pinned to him, and he's smiling with his hair combed. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was weird that they were showing that because that was years before this happened. I don't know. I, I My own two cents. But we have a podcast, so I can put my own two cents in it. I, I think sometimes it might be, you know, like for the Carlo Mercado case, I, I wonder if that's the only picture that some of those people had access to. You know, I would. I don't know if they... You saw, I mean, I looked a lot of those stories were so often reprinted from an an original source Uh and with copywriting of, of photographs. I don't know if they actually had access to the photos or they, or, or even tried to, but like modern, modern news. Now you put on something mm -hmm. on Twitter and then, hi, I'm the producer of blah, blah, blah. Can I use your picture? And I mean, they could have just asked the news if they were, if they wanted to be that into it. But I also think at this time, you know, we also have to factor in that everyone is a content creator too. So there, there's plenty of cases of people borrowing a photo and then being called on the carpet for it, or because you know, if I took a photo, I want to, I want compensation for that, or right. I want, I want, like you said, I want the right photo to portray the the story that I want to get out about this person. I think the the D'Angelo story is is on on his side it is manipulation manipulation i think the media might have been um unintentionally complicit in that and the fact of they're trying to report it as it happens and and what they're given access to is they're given access to the frail old man in court and that's the way he wanted people to see him and and i don't i don't think it necessarily was a malicious thing that the the news media was trying to do i think it was it was what ma- d'angelo was trying to do mm-hmm. and because they were reporting at the time that's that's what happened you know but i i, I agree with you is like they could have done i believe they could have done some more research and like posting up those other pictures and or or going out and, and finding them you yeah know? or just like a split a split you still have old right, one and right. the young one exactly the same the same with the carlo mercado you you know you see the same two pictures you see the one in the, or t- there's two in the court Right from the same angle, and you see the one the the prom picture. I can't believe that there isn't somebody else out there. You know, right? And, and there was did, hardly any. Yeah. Did did you do your due diligence? You know, and, and report that then. Well, and the one that I saw in the court of Carlo Mercado, I mean, he does not look good. I guess is what I'm trying to. I mean, no, you see a lot of people go to trial and they have they you know they dress the part and their lawyers make sure they look a certain way. And he, there's no middle ground in that case. There's that prom photo, or there's him looking very right. disturbed. His almost. hair was greasy, and yeah. yeah, yeah. And, just, and yeah. In fact, when you first brought that and and sent those pictures, Sean, I I thought you had made a mistake. I had to actually, I did, I went back and did another search through the newspaper archive and through a couple other things to make sure that those were the right photos. And they, and because that that threw me. Yeah, they are so different. And again, you can see those. Like those are two pictures we have on our CaliforniaTrueCrime.com under the Carlo Mercado episode page. Um, we posted those up with a caption and a link to where those original sources come from. But it's a good question. And I think, you know, if you're in our Facebook group or on any of our social media, let, let us know what you think about 
the pictures that are used for different cases and how you feel about what should be used. Because I do think the, the way someone looks informs a lot of our opinions. I will also put a link out to the victim's impact statements that happened this last year. I know we did it already, but just in case someone hasn't seen them, they are amazing what the victims did in this case, standing up, speaking their mind, talking about what happened to them. It's just absolutely incredible. And I think it will pave the way for hopefully other victims to do the same and to feel comfortable doing the same. And it's also a good reminder that this, that, you know, what happened in that case happened to communities. The DA in Sacramento, Amory Schubert, has actually created a book. She's compiled stories. So not just victims, but people who lived in Sacramento, what it was like to go through that. It's free. It's online. I will put a link to it on our social media. It is called Sacramento, A Community Forever Changed. So check that out, definitely. We haven't covered this case, but there are also uh, three podcasts that we can recommend to you about it. Case File, I think, covered this case. Mm-hmm. And you got you both listened to that yes. one. Yes. Yes. You love case file. Criminology has also covered this case. And it exposed the East Area Rapist. Yeah, that one was my favorite because it really went in depth, especially at the beginning, about the kind of social mores at the mm-hmm. time and what the victims experienced as far as you know being able to speak about what happened to them. I, I found that one very compelling and really well done. It's It's hard to beat. And again, I am a little bit biased, but case file is... is always does a great job and we're i think the three of us are very big fans but exposed was i thought i'm with you jessica as far as getting you a feel for not only the time period but the place i i as a as a california native who spent time in sacramento and has friends and family that have lived there and and not being an expert of the area, but but I felt like yeah they got it right they and and as well as the especially in the, the interview that that's not aside from the victims' interviews which I think are amazing for the fact that they would uh, that open about what happened but the the interview with the female detective that led the charge early on that I uh, she's amazing yeah and I don't think that she's always gotten the the credit and and that she rightly deserves but i think if you're interested in that aspect and especially the early days of the case this is a great podcast to listen to the other big news that came out just at the end of the year and this is a case that i'm going to mention because it has been suggested to us several several times by people is the michaela garrett case out of hayward california she was nine years old when she was kidnapped in 1988 and they have made an arrest in that case Uh, they have arrested a man named david meesh for allegedly kidnapping her I know a lot of us watched, there were a few of us at least, watched the press conference when it happened just a couple weeks ago, and it's just kind of amazing that this has happened. And so we're going to keep you updated when we find out more information about that case, But and hopefully maybe now we'll even cover it. It's been on our list, and yeah. it's, it's, it's just fascinating what happened in that press conference and what the police said they had to do to make that arrest. They kind of just, I'm just blown away by that, so... It's very exciting news. And last year, there were actually a lot of cases in California solved using, uh, this one didn't use DNA, but others that use DNA. We've written about some of them on our website, on our blog. So I'll put some more links out about those. And we'll keep updating you guys with new information as things are found. Were you traumatized as a child by watching Unsolved Mysteries? Do you like to judge facial hair? (laughs) Guess what? We have a podcast for you. Can you believe it? It's called Perhaps It's You, and it is an unofficial Unsolved Mysteries rewatch podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Samantha. I'm Liz. We're two cool mystery ants, not really, (laughs) who watch an episode of Unsolved Mysteries each week. And tell you about it. We update you if any of the mysteries have been solved. We rate the episode on a scale of Robert Stacks. We can give episodes a possible five out of five Robert Stacks, although it rarely happens. Very rarely. We also complain about what everyone is wearing. And it doesn't really matter if you know anything about Unsolved Mysteries or not. You should tune in because it's the number one podcast on iTunes. Yeah, you can find us on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, most podcast platforms. You can also check out our website, perhapsitsyou.com, or find us on the social medias at Perhaps It's You. Yep. Anything else, you guys, before we do questions? Or do you want to do reviews? We can do a, a review or two. 
Last year, we were also, we got some lovely ratings from people. We've got some interesting ratings as well. Um, if you want to rate us on whatever platform that you use, that would be great, especially if you enjoy our podcast. Sean, I think you had an interesting review you wanted to talk about. Yeah. I actually, if you don't like our podcast, go ahead and review us because I actually like these and they are fun to read. <laughs> so this one... Um, we did a bonus episode on the big game disaster, the Stanford Cal game and what happened. And this one, we got three out of five stars, which is actually nice for what the it's the review is called Big Game Disaster. And it says, I was ex- I was super excited when I saw the title, but within five minutes of listening, the dude talks about how he doesn't like football. I don't care what you like personally. Just don't say that that right before you talk about a subject. It really turns me off, so I didn't continue. Maybe don't be <laughs> sorry. Maybe don't be so honest about a topic you are about to, to discuss because it weakens the excitement like a cook saying they messed up a dish as they are giving it to you. <laughs> so, okay, I guess we cats out of the bag. We are actually all in a basement in Florida. And we know nothing about California, <laughs> and we're just trying to do this. No. But I just think it's it's funny. Don't be honest. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm not going to be honest at all anymore. I, I will admit I obsessed over that for a couple of days. Um, because if, you're not, if you didn't listen to the episode, please go back and listen to our Thanksgiving Day episode from this year. Because uh, I was the person that said they don't like football. Yes, that's true. I do not really care for football. I don't see a problem with being honest about that. Yeah, and I mean, we still talked football, but it wasn't really about the game that much. It was about the other (laughs) stuff. So, I don't know. I I wouldn't worry about it, Charles. You're doing fine, even if you hate football. No, I'm I'm over it. I've I've cried my tears. (laughs) I have... have, um, No, I'm good now. I appreciate it. Uh, But I also do want to thank him for the three stars. That is nice. Yeah, it's not bad. So, he didn't hold it against the rest of you. I just... Yeah, we've actually been really lucky. We've gotten a lot more really lovely reviews this past year. Yes. It's been very, I mean, not that we've ever gotten a ton of terrible ones or anything, but we really appreciate people reviewing and a lot of them have been helpful. Um, so that's always good, but we just, you know, I know it takes time and I, I'm terrible at reviewing things I listen to. I will do better if some people out there maybe want to review our podcast. <laughs> well, I think we'll read a good one. This is uh, by Annoyed2020, but that's titled great podcast and gave us five out of five and said the research for this podcast, the research for this podcast is extensive and the hosts have great chemistry. I love true crime and this is the best kind of true crime. So thank you. Annoyed 2020. And yeah, I mean, we can't please everyone, especially people who really like football. Obviously we can't please football (laughs) fans. We can't be please people who think everyone need to have law enforcement backgrounds to say the word police officer. (laughs) Aside from some really great reviews um, that we're always appreciative of, uh, we actually had a chance to guest star, I guess guest star, guest host. I feel like I'm on, on Sean's favorite TV show, love boat, you know, this week's guest star, but um (laughs) We were given an opportunity to guest host uh, a couple of our favorite podcasts, so I do want to give a shout out to them. Um, one was an amazing uh, horror podcast called Behind the Screams Podcast. Uh, you can check them out on Twitter and Facebook. Um, they deal with uh, horror movies, and we were asked to come on and talk about a particular movie, Drag Me to Hell, actually. So that was really fun. Uh, really had a great time on there. The host is amazing, and they do a great job. We also got called on to be a guest on the Bungalow Chat Show, which has been uh, part of our podcasting family for uh, since basically we started and um, got a chance to be interview- interviewed in the Bungalow, not in the, virtually in the Bungalow by Cole and had an absolute blast. Uh, if you haven't listened to, to the Bungalow Chat Show, please check it out. It is a... Uh, it is a fun show that I guarantee you will come away with smiling and um, thinking about topics you may not have thought about before. Yeah, Cole, Cole's pretty amazing at bringing up amazing things and prolific. If you uh, if you are in if you like chat shows or talk shows, uh, I think he is up to an episode a week now. 
Uh, I think for a while there, he was putting out a couple of episodes a week. They're great. Listen to a morning commute as, as is behind the screams. Um, his episodes are a little bit longer, but he just actually put out their end of the year, best horror movies of 2020 episode, which was really good. So, um, please do us a favor and check them out both on, um, their social medias, uh, again, behind the screams podcast and bungalow chat show. If you'd like more information about any of those shows, as well as a bunch of others shows, you can check out our website, California true crime.com. We have a podcasting family page where we have posted up links to some of our favorite podcasts, as well as some of the podcasts that helped us out as well as, as ones that we consider friends and, and, um, colleagues. So before we get to these amazing questions I have for you guys that I found on the internet, um, I just want to also thank our Patreon members. They've stuck with us this year. We are very bad at at making sure people know that we have a Patreon and for getting members, but we really, really, really appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, It's helped us. I know we've done a ton more research this year and been able to, I just actually filled out a FOIA request. So I'm really excited about that. Um, So that all of that money goes towards our, basically our research. And it's been a really big, important thing for us. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. And this year, our Patreon's got a special bonus. We actually, uh, finally, after uh, a long time, we have got official California true crime stickers. Um, So if you were on our Patreon list, um, you got a special delivery of uh, some goodies in a envelope, as well as um, our regular sticker and a couple of bonus stickers that we made for our Halloween episodes. So we thank you very, very much for your patronage. And if you'd like more information, again, you know what I'm going to say next. You can go to our CaliforniaTrueCrime.com to find all of our information about our Patreon. Okay, so I have some questions. I found them on the internet. I guess they're questions Californians get asked quite a bit. And these are for people, because in our episodes, we don't really get a chance to really kind of like joke around or be ourselves. Um, This episode is already an hour. It's probably because we talk too much. So this is why. We do. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I'm just going to ask some questions. We'll try and answer them the best we can. And maybe you'll learn some stuff about us as people. So one of the first questions is, as Californians, do you visit the beach all the time or surf? Sean? No. I I go sometimes. I do not surf. I remember boogie boarding when I was a kid, and I tried to do it too shallow, and my boogie board stuck in the sand, and the the end of it came back into my stomach and cut me. And I had like a cut Holy on moly. my stomach. It wasn't Four. like I was bleed, you know, like a pressure kind of, it yeah. kind of, yeah. and I hated it. So, but I, if I go to the beach, we go to like Pacifica where it's freezing and windy and I love it, but, um, I don't like get in the water. How about you, Charles? Well, I think you know the answer to this. Uh, no, I have never surfed. I'm not against it. I think it. Uh, I don't have. <laughs> I'm not, I don't have a moral stand against it. I. I don't have the greatest balance, so I'm a hundred percent sure I would. I would not be able to stand up. I have also seen an inordinate amount of shark movies. So yes, I. I am pretty sure I would be attacked by a shark when I did it. I'm with Sean. I don't like beaches with a lot of people. I much prefer. Like I'm thinking, like Pacific, like for me, it was like Pacific Grove. Uh, I had family that my grandmother grew up there, and so going to see those where it's it's cold it's windy there's a lot of rocks there's not a lot of people like beaches in florida just freak me out there's too many people it's too hot there's too much sand i think this is one of our nitpicky things when people this this because this question i immediately think someone hasn't been to california or doesn't realize california right. has a lot of different things we do not live too far from the beach just a couple hours but we probably should go more often i do like the beach but we don't go all the time i can surf I used to surf a little bit about 10 years ago, but it's been a while, so I don't surf all the time. A lot of Californians do, just not us here in the Central Valley. Right. This was a weird one that came up a couple times. Have you ever seen snow? This is weird because <laughs> I bear, I, I've seen snow, okay? But yeah. I, growing up, we didn't go to the snow much. We were an hour, hour 15 away from snow. The weird thing about this the first time I ever saw snow fall, I was 26, and it was actually in Oregon, driving yeah. with no chains, trying to get over a mountain, listening 
to Hulkster in Heaven from the Hulk Hogan and the Wrestling Boot Band album that came out in 1994, where Hulkster sings a a sad song to someone who was a fan who might have died. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I actually remember that It's song. not Hulk Hogan singing it because he doesn't actually sing, but he has the wrestling boot band that will mm-hmm. sing. <laughs> but anyway, that I actually, the first time I ever saw snow fall, I wasn't in California, but. We went to the snow all the time. Where we live, it doesn't mm-hmm. snow, but we're about 30 minutes usually in the winter from, from snow. And I have family who live, mm-hmm. you know, up in the snow. So. Yeah, I think before I was 18, I saw it maybe three times. We never went. We did We did a lot. Like when I was a kid, we did the same. We, you know, I actually, uh, much to the delight of my wife, who constantly brings us up in inopportune times, I took ice skating lessons when I was a kid. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, I, I was not good and uh, involved in a terrible accident that cost my aunt breaking her wrist but that's another story (laughs) however um we went up a lot now since i've been an adult and 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 moved away you know maybe once or twice a year we'll go up to the mountains now and either visit family or you know play in the snow in fact we're you know like to do it when things open up a little bit more and it's safer but yeah we we have seen snow in california and there's a lot of there are some of our friends and family that live in places where it snows quite a bit I was just surprised by this question. I assume it's maybe you kind of think of this this area of just think of California as like a sunny, right, LA right. type yeah. situation. It's, I'm not really sure, it's but a I mean, even down there, mile there's, strip you know. along the beach. Yeah. Do we tan all the time? No, <laughs> that's just the answer. Nope. Yeah. No, I am actually pretty close to see through. Actually. Yeah. One time, my friend she owned a tanning salon. And Josh and I went and tried that out, but no, I don't tan. Uh -uh. (laughs) Do we wear mostly shorts and flip-flops, even in the winter? A hundred percent, yes. No. Yeah. (laughs) I am am bundled up. I don't wear flip-flops at all, because right when that string goes in between my two toes, my whole foot cramps up, and it's like, like, I can't handle it, but... I'm freezing constantly, and in the summer, when it's 104 out, that's when I'm mowing the lawn, because I'm, I'm never hot, so no. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I wear, uh, with the exception of my work, which, much to my chagrin, I was, uh, uh, the dress code is I, cannot, I can't wear shorts. At, at home, uh, it's, I wear shorts pretty much year-round. And then I was a flip flop person up until recently when I bought uh, a my first pair of Croc knockoffs, uh, and they are awesome. So yeah, I I don't I won't say I, I don't dress like the ter- stereotypical Californian. I don't think what they're thinking of, but you know, yeah, it's t shirts and t shirts and shorts for me pretty much year round. And Jess, what uh, what about you? Probably a mixture, but yeah, I a lot of shorts and I guess flip flops. Yeah, I know anybody. We've had a few roommates, and they've always hated us because we never turn the heater on. Right, we're just kind of hot all the time, so we are that stereotypical <laughs> California couple, I guess. Yes. This was a good one. How do you guys go to Disneyland a lot? Oh yeah, <laughs> like I, I mean, I would buy. I lived very far away from it, um, but I would buy annual passes. I remember one time. I had friends who had annual passes who lived down there. I went down there. I drove. I met my friend Ben. We went on one ride, and then we just sat around at Disneyland the rest of the day and then left. (laughs) I would just go (laughs) walk around. The last time I went to go visit friends one time, and I still had my annual pass, I went by myself. And I had to kill time. And I'm like, oh, I'll go on Pirates. And they put me in the back row by myself, but then left rows. And then had, like, a family in front. So when you come around, like, the, the loop of shame at the beginning, everyone's just staring at me going, who's that one guy in the back row? And I'm like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here right now. I got to leave. <laughs> I bet, uh, in fact, I love, for any of our listeners, if you ever want to know anything about Disneyland, Sean is the person to, to uh, hit up. So uh, feel free to tweet him. 
uh, or post up questions about Disneyland because actually that's that was the fun thing to say. Sean is a fan of of Disneyland. I think is an understatement, really. I, I do enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. I think. Jessica, how about you? How many times have you gone to Disneyland? I don't know, just a lot? handful of times. We went last year. You yeah, and I. That's the first time. For the first time together, and then it was the first time you had been in decades. Uh, I am old, and so it, the last time I went to Disneyland, I was, uh, I think Reagan was in office, and it was like <laughs> soon after, soon after Reagan got elected, that I went to Disneyland for the first. I'll, uh, for for our older listeners, it was when Captain EO and Star Tours, the original, like Star Tours had just opened, was the last time I went to to, to Disneyland. So, so I think that's, you know, I like that you're defining your age, not by number of years, but by presidents now. <laughs> it's just, it's just easier. Yeah. Each of my kids went at three months old to Disneyland and, uh, they really had a good time. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, I mean, Melanie was pregnant like three times with each kid when we went, we, we used to go all the time. So, I mean, obviously we didn't, we didn't go in 2020 because we went November of 19. I think we have some uh, fans of the, or fans, I was, <laughs> it's the wrong, there are friends and family, uh, but we also think hopefully they're fans of the show, but uh, um, Brad, Melissa, and Wendy specifically, who have taken their kids multiple times. I think the, the kids have went more times before they were 10 than I have been in my entire life, and <laughs> most people I know have been in their entire life. So I, I, that's a hard question because I think it's depending on where you live in the state and if you, you know, I think it's anywhere else. If you like amusement parks and you like crowds and can't afford it, can't, yeah, if, yeah, yeah, it's really expensive. I think that's what always catches me. But it is one of those stereotypes that I do think kind of holds up with most mm-hmm. people. Do we eat Mexican food every day? Yes, <laughs> every chance I get. Yeah, I say often, but I mean, I, I can't do it every day. I don't want to ruin it. I, I have never been to Texas. Um, I have been to Mexico a few times, but I, I will say that we have the best Mexican food in the United States. I'm 100% confident in saying that. Do you guys like in and out I know this is a question that will make people angry on the internet, so. <laughs> That's fine. I do not. I eat it. It's not like I'm, but I'll avoid it. And I don't like that they don't have much of a selection. I, there's other reasons I don't like it. <laughs> and I just don't like it. I don't like the fries actually at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll go out on this. I'll get some hate mail for this. I'm okay with it. <laughs> uh, I, I do not like their fries. I right. think they are terrible. Yeah. They're not good. Jessica, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I love of? their fries. I love in and out I mean, I'm not, you know, wearing their shirt around or anything, but I think it's a delicious place to eat. I'm totally for it. It's always busy. Which is the bigger problem. And so we rarely right. get it because, well, A, we, now we live in a town that doesn't have one. But, you know, it's just kind of a pain to have to sit in traffic to get a burger. But I love in and out Yeah. Do we have a lot of celebrity stories? Or have we seen a lot of movie stars? Because, you know, <laughs> California. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, do you want one? Sure. <laughs> like, I don't know. There's plenty of times like at Disneyland. I One time... I was walking on the main street and this guy was, had his grandchild and he's like, or yeah, I think it's grand. And he's like, do you want a vanilla ice cream sandwich? And he ran into me cause he wasn't paying attention and it was Alan thick. Oh wow. But I mean, things like that. Yeah. I think Disneyland's one of the places I've seen the most right. uh, random celebrities. I have like, well, what do you classify as a celebrity? Like somebody like everybody knows or it, like it's people really not that, that serious consider? of a question. Oh, well, sorry. I'd I like, think it's uh, because like, of Hollywood. How right? do you, they just how do you how, well, well, yeah. You know, I mean, like I'm a nerd. So I've met like there's, you know, like nerd conventions and things like comic book conventions, sci-fi conventions. You run into like famous people, you know, you get yeah. their autographs. I think just casually running into on the street. Well, we saw Vince Vaughn last year at Disneyland, actually at Pirates of Caribbean and like gave him the. Well, I can't take credit for that. Our f- friend Ben gave him that, like a head nod, like "What's up, man?" And then, um, oh, Kirk Douglas. I ran into Kirk Douglas when I was a kid at Monterey, at the um, uh, Rappa's restaurant at the end of the pier, at the end of the wharf. He was there with people, and I was a little kid, and I like sp- I love Spartacus, uh, the movie, and that was cool. 
I like how the how just the question is uh, formed. Do we have a lot of celebrity stories or seen a movie star? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just seen one. <laughs> We're living in those uh, everyone's famous times. So do we eat a lot of avocados? Sure. I do. No. Yeah. Well, you don't like avocados. I don't like avocados. Jessica, you, Jess, you, you eat a lot. Yeah. They are very common out here. Uh, I don't know. It was two years ago when we were out in Merced. You and I went to take some pictures when we were doing the Steven Stainer case, and we actually drove the four up into the mountains mm-hmm. just to kind of watch that path. And on our way there, there was a fruit stand just mm-hmm. randomly, and it had 25 avocados for a dollar. Whoa, that's awesome. I know. That I think about awesome. it all of the good time. Good deal. <laughs> yes. I did ask numerous times if she wanted to pull yeah. over and get 20 and but uh, she kept saying no and then um such we, a good we, deal we, i know we got to hear about it all the way home. i think about it all the time <laughs> and it was a physical stand because the other thing here in california especially in central valley yeah. is that there is a an underground avocado trade as well as several other fruits or nuts <laughs> so this is an interesting different which, kind of crime we've never covered yeah which we, we may we may have to put that on the list of for future yeah, there's some pretty daring. Yeah. I've learned a lot about the avocado one. So there's some local slang, apparently, that has to do with California. Um, do you guys use the word hella? Nope. I, I did. I am a recovering hella addict. But um, I, yeah, I not, feel like a lot of these words are like from the 90s. Yeah. I don't hear it very often. I know this one's a big for you, Charles. Almonds versus. Ammons. It is Ammons. I don't care what you other people say. It's Ammons. We all call them Ammons. I call them Almonds. Ugh. Do you guys use the word bomb? Like that's... Nope. Yeah. No, I, 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 I have used it, but it's more of like tongue-in-cheek, like making fun of somebody that uses it. Uh, the word butthurt came up in several questions. I didn't realize that was a California... Is that California it, only? It said it wasn't only, but it said that it started here in California. Oh wow, that seems like I so use that one. Ju- junior high, yeah, yeah. it does. I, uh, I do. I use it. I talk like a junior high kid most times. A lot of these are really like, I don't know how to say. That's heavy. Well, I think oh, that that's like that's like a hit. That's like a hippie thing. No, that's like eighties. Yeah, that, heavy. Yeah, I think of Back to the Future. That's all Marty would say. Oh, that's heavy. Oh. Yeah. There's some that have to do with June Gloom that has to do with surfing. I have uh, never even the, heard of that. Yeah. The industry. I uh, don't think pro- we refer Hollywood? to the industry. Yeah. Maybe if you work in it. I guess. Oh, you I mean, mean in s- the city? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, not that. Well, well no, because like, I know. I know. Like Northern California, San Francisco. Do, do people call, like in Southern California, do people call LA the city? No, but the city of industry. Oh, oh, That's I what I was talking oh, about. oh, nice one, nice one, nice callback to our episodes dealing with the city of industry. <laughs> and same with Back to the Future; it's the same right. episode. Uh, is the traffic really bad here? Like, actually? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I guess just in California. I think that's anywhere, but I in uh, California. I don't in Cal big cities in California. Yeah, it's bad. The only other time I've dealt with things like that was New York. Like the New York traffic was horrible. And- I want to say it's mo- uh, and I'll I'll disagree a little bit in saying it. I think it's most places in the Central Valley. Well, I'm know, just talking. I- LA is terrible. Sacramento yeah. doesn't seem as bad as LA. Bay Area was horrible when I lived there. Uh, Sacramento is terrible if you don't understand how to drive in Sacramento. I, I understand that, but I feel like it flows still. Like it's weird. It's all over the place, but. Bay Area and Los Angeles is just you're stopped. Yeah. Yeah, Sacramento seems to flow okay. Mike could be wrong. No, I have uh, we have friends that live and work there, and and tr- tr- I always try to ride with them when we go that direction be- because it is one of those places that it is re- like a knot, and if you don't know exactly where to on ramps, not off ramps. Oh, I don't like driving in the cities. J- Jess, you, Jessica usually drives. As soon as we get to like, if we're going to the Bay Area, right past the Altamont, we usually swap out, and she drives in the city. Have you guys ever been in an earthquake? Yeah, nothing exciting. Yeah, yeah. I think when I live when I lived in the Bay Area, I was in a four point two. 
Yeah, the big one. I mean, the the you know, we felt. I mean, where we've, mm-hmm. we, I think around here, you feel a lot of the big ones. Um, but yeah, that's not. I've never been. Oh, I've never I, been I in remember the epicenter. Right, I remember feeling. I remember looking at the plant in my house that hung in the '89 earthquake here. Yeah, like uh, at where we lived, but and that was kind of far away. Uh, my wife was actually. She was in Watsonville during the big mm-hmm. one, so it was big for her. Yeah, I traveled. I was not near it. Felt it in '89, and then traveled into the area after, like about a week later, and saw the devastation and stuff. And I was, we were, I was in high school at the time. Yeah, I, I think it's weird to me, off subject, that those roads used to be double deckers. I didn't learn about that until like yeah. two or three years ago when I watched some footage. I had no clue. Uh, All the roads that I knew from the Bay Area used to be like like the Bay Bridge, but they yeah. were just the roads in the city. That was yeah. crazy to me. Do we use words like Frisco? I no. I I say the city. Yeah, I yeah, say the city I say the or city San Francisco. Too. Yeah, I don't um, say Frisco. Yeah, and I I don't like Frisco that. was like nails on a chalkboard. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you it's you fine, but it's, you got you you and Sean both live there, right? I, yeah, I would never use that word. Yeah. Right. There. SoCal, NorCal, no. we use those sometimes. I, I, every once in a while, I guess. I mean, when I get, say so, I when I think of Southern California, I lot a lot of times just say L.A. To me, it's you call it San Diego or you call it L.A. No matter where it is yeah. down there. Yeah. I mean, I just say I'm going to L.A. Oh, where at? I don't know. Like I'm just going to be around L.A. So, and then San Diego is such a big area. Yeah, and San Diego is like two hours more south of LA so I say San Diego if I'm going there but I usually just use like if for some reason I'm going to Fresno or Bakersfield I say where I'm going Mm -hmm. if you're not from California you may not know how diverse but also how separate I mean we're one giant state but also like growing up in Northern California I didn't go to Southern California very often so it's it is really to me like an entirely different country and so I, I still, I'm mean, growing up, I thought anything south of Fresno was a whole, you know, that's, that's yeah. all yeah. Southern California. And, and that's not true, but I think, I think a lot of times you do, you do get a feeling of, I won't say sectionalism, but this, you know. Well, there are disagreements. Right. I right, mean, right. because we live in the Central Valley and that's where we grew up and I'm really proud to have lived here, but it's such an important part of California that doesn't always get mm-hmm. talked about or noticed, especially in commercials and stuff. And a lot of these questions kind of represent that. But I remember I had a friend from Sacramento, or I still have a friend from Sacramento, and he was adamant that Sacramento was part of the Bay Area, which was so weird right, to me because right. Sacramento was part of the Central Valley, but... So there's a lot of little infights. Yeah, like I think that. a lot. Mm-hmm. And another thing is I never shorten that. I just say, if I, I'm, I yeah. say, oh, I have to go to Northern California. Oh, we're at Redding. Like, I, you know, I say, I say it all out. I don't like the yeah. shortened version of these things. No, and I think that's, I, I agree. I think those, because so many of us are rubbed the raw from not necessarily, and I'm sure every state, every country has a little bit of version of this. Or you you may have this from where you're if you're listening to this where you're from too, that outsiders don't necessarily always pay attention to what what the real story is or what the real culture of the area is, and so it is almost kind of disrespectful. Like Reading's a neat place. I had friends that I actually, we have friends that still live there. That it is fun. It's a different place, but <laughs> it's uh, those places are unique and individual and should be kind of paid their respect that they're due. The big one that um, I know is real, and I know people have a problem with it, we use it because of our podcast, is Cali. People saying Cali instead yeah. of California. I like how Cali true crime sounds, mm-hmm. kind of, but I would never use the word, oh, yeah. I where do you live? I would never say <laughs> yeah, I Cali. Don't, yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not LL Cool J. <laughs> no, and actually, our email, Cali true crime at gmail.com and all of our Twitter handles I think stemmed from our email that I act. It was I believe it was me that typed it in wrong. Well, California is a long word. Yeah. It is. So when you're going to use it as a hashtag or something, it's just so long, right, and then right. you add the rest of your name of your podcast. And I love how it sounds, but in conversation or just I, out yeah. in the regular world. And I don't know anyone that does shorten it. Mm-mm. Not I know anyone. people here do have a. I'm never like chastise someone or anything, but I know people have an issue with I it. I think I might chastise them. <laughs> That's on you. What's your favorite California movie? Oh, 
I know this is a hard one. Um, oh my! I'm gonna have to say, I mean, just like based in California, is that or yeah, like a movie yeah. about California that is that we are strictly based. okay? Oh, okay, because yeah, I'm thinking like... the first thing that comes to mind is True Romance, just because oh. I love that yeah. movie. I've been to the I've been to the movie theater where Alabama and Clarence meet and watch their movies. The Safari Inn is down in Burbank where mm-hmm. Brad Pitt is on the couch and there's a couple restaurants that I go eat at where I can just look at the Safari Inn, <laughs> which is exciting to me. <laughs> and I've been on the Viper at, um, at Magic Mountain that Balky pukes on. I mean, it's just, a, oh, yeah. it's such a good movie and it's like my favorite movie anyway. And it has all these pieces that I can go to, but I think that's just California. I remember I went to go meet my friend Mark for Boys Weekend, where we just rent a hotel, eat garbage food, and watch Food Network in a hotel without our kids. And my tire blew up, but I was on almost to his house, and I look across the street, and I'm like, oh, that's Chili John's, where the it was a scene in the new Twin Peaks on Showtime. So even though my tire was completely blown up, I was so excited. <laughs> I blew up right in front of Chili John. So I think that's just California in a way that you find places like that. I, I don't have one. I, I Whoa. It's because I think I'm with Sean I'm with Sean on this is that there's there's so many. Now and this might be an entirely different pod er, podcast or or episode dealing with movies strictly from california because for me there's always those movies that portray california you know that's strictly about california that does it wrong there's a lot of them that you just just does not get stuff right Mm -hmm. there are places in movies that like role models is still i love the movie role models the comedy and there's a particular restaurant that they eat in during one of the after one of the um larps and we've been to that, Jessica and I have been to that restaurant, um, Shakers in Pasadena. I absolutely love that place. Part of the reason I love that movie is because we were there. Um, so I think that's always fun is when you see a place. Um, I think one of the movies, that, that if I were to pick a movie that I think did California really well to the scenery, the places, the the look is is uh, David Fincher's Zodiac. Oh, yeah. I love that movie. I think it's, I'm a David Fincher fan. I love the subject matter. But I think when you look at the way that movie was filmed, it really does capture not only San Francisco, but the surrounding areas and the Bay Area specifically. You know, also the other one, a huge shout out because they were filmed in San Francisco is obviously the Dirty Harry movies, specifically Dirty Harry. The first one is, I think, if you want to know what San Francisco is like in the 70s, obviously not with. Harry Callahan running around with his 44 Magnum, but it has a really cool feel of like, that's what the city was like. You actually stole mine. Oh, I'm I sorry. I was going to say Dirty I'm Harry sorry. movies or because I love San Francisco so much and you're really seeing the buildings and the, the bay yeah. and the places and stuff, but also the Zodiac because Vallejo looks like Vallejo right. and you know, you can see all the places really, they're, they just look so much like what we're used to seeing, what we're always trying to at least describe to people you know, these cities are big, but they often look very different or where the crimes happen. And I would rec, I would recommend the Presidio with Sean Connery and Mark. Yeah, Mark that's Harmon. another good, that's a great one. That was a good San Francisco movie. And I think what separates some of these movies from other ones. And again, this is going to be like a four hour podcast when we, when you get the three of us talking about films in California. But to me, one of the things about some of these movies is that the colors in California, it's hard if you're not from here. Because so many people associate it with the beach. And the beach is, to me, is very, you know, you have the blue ocean and you have the sand. But the gold of the hills uh, when the weather turns hot and the mm-hmm. grass turns mm-hmm. to this to this beautiful gold color. Or the snow on the Sierra Nevadas. And there's this rich tapestry of color that I don't think a lot of people really get in films a lot of times when they're when they're when they're supposed to be set in, in California, but they don't understand what California really looks like. And I'm sure everybody talks about their hometown or their home state like this. But yeah, I think so. It's a long winded answer for that, but that's a good question. The last movie I'll say is Clueless. Yeah, that's, I, I was really, thinking of that too. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I felt like those what? people I know, I remember. Yeah, it just that's no kidding. Okay, that's part of California. That to was me. Yeah, totally the time, and as because you had like. 
You had the the skater kid with his flannel. You had Mullet Head by the Beastie Boys on the soundtrack. The Beastie Boys are actually from New York, but they they moved to L.A. and did a lot of their Grand Royal stuff in Glen, the Glendale area. So they were very L.A. during that time, and it was Clueless is definitely that, yeah. You guys just made me want to watch Clueless again, which... Well, even the places they go to, they look, you know, like you're like in the California. valley or you're okay. in the city or... I'm going to have to... Those I'm big, beautiful uh, high schools that we've talked about in other places yeah. that we don't live in in California, <laughs> right. but they exist. And it's just like Chana's saying, just to me, those are real people and... But I think what's weird is like, I think I drove by the high school that Greece was filmed at and it's just oh. like, you know, like I, I was driving somewhere and then... My friend who was with me, he's like, oh, that's the high school that Greece was filmed at. We're just in like this boring neighborhood. It like ruined when you see certain <laughs> things like that. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. that I'm super into Greece, but I was just like, this movie is like an icon kind of movie to a lot of people, yeah. like a cult classic. And then you see it as like an actual high school with some houses. around. <laughs> it was weird. Things like that. Is it down in L.A.? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I might. Maybe Rydale I'm thinking. High. Yeah, now I have to look it up to make sure I was <laughs> thinking of the right high school. But well, I will say that, that, and I'm sure people that live in other parts of other parts of the United States or other countries, when you see a movie that's supposed to be set in your town or your country or your state, and it doesn't look right, I think that's a hard one for, to look at stuff from California and realize that's not what that's not what people would be wearing and in winter in san francisco or that's not that is definitely not what people are you know doing in la at christmas time or you know those kind of things where it really sticks out sometimes i know I, in in this house anything in san francisco you're really quick to point out all the incongruities and the mistakes just <laughs> which is awesome because i you know having lived there like you did and worked there and it's given me a new appreciation for stuff like you know like how that stuff is portrayed which brings us to our last question. What is one of your favorite places in California? That's Disneyland right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's a tough one. There's so many great places. I honestly, I'm going to say Knights Ferry, California. Uh, I was born there. I still have family there. And I, I swear my family originally came from where they came from many, many years ago and settled. And it's always, it. I go, when I have a chance and go back, it's still a place that holds great memories. And so it's, yeah, I'll say that, home. I'm going to go with the Presidio in San Francisco. I When I went to college in San Francisco, uh, one of the years I was there, they had to shut down the apartments on campus because of mold. And so they had to find places for us to live. And I was lucky enough to live in army barracks in the Presidio Oh, wow. And it was really amazing and really beautiful. You had the Golden Gate Bridge right there. And it's constantly foggy. And it was like living in the middle of the city, but also in a forest. And it was just, it's just one of my pla- favorite places on earth. If you ever go to San Francisco, try to go to the Presidio. There's hiking there. There's um, easy access to beaches. At night, you can hear the foghorn on the Golden Gate Bridge. It's just the most, one of the most perfect places in California as far as I'm concerned. So we just want to thank everyone for listening to this episode, for listening to our first and the beginning of our second season, and for hopefully listening to the rest of what's coming up. Yeah, thank you. We're looking forward to uh, a great 2021 and uh, many, many new episodes. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks again for listening to this episode of California True Crime. Don't forget that you can support the show by finding a link to our Patreon page, which uh, with many different options for support. As Jessica said earlier, all of your donations go to help us do more research and put out the best quality product possible. We appreciate any patronage. Please listen, rate, and subscribe on whatever podcast app you're listening to. We really appreciate any any reviews, both positive and negative but we really like the positive ones. Please hit us up on social media. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Cali True Crime. You can find us on Facebook at the California True Crime discussion page. We have a private discussion page where you can join that we're always willing to answer questions. We'd also like to thank, as always, our quality control engineer, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at The Hangar and Snail Ranch Studios. This is a production of Wake Grimace.